Good morning. It's good to see you all here. My name is Roy Champa. I'm the chair of the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the first of our 2023 Holly Hall Lectures. The Howard L. and Martha H. Holly Lectures, New Testament Voices for a Contemporary World, given in honor of Dr. William E. Hall each fall. They're sponsored by our department, the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies. Dr. Hull, who lived from 1930 until 2013, was a Baptist minister and New Testament scholar. He served Samford as provost from 1987 to 1996, as university prof professor from 1996 to the year 2000, and as research professor for the remainder of his life. He also served as theologian in residence at Mountain Brook Baptist Church from 1991 until 2013. The Holly family were members of his church, and we're honored to have two members of the Holly family here with us today and grateful for the sponsorship of these lectures. The Holly Hall lectures address a wide range of topics in New Testament studies and contemporary theological and social issues. This year, we're honored to have as our Holly Hall lecturer, Dr. Juan Hernandez. Dr. Hernandez is the professor of biblical studies at Bethel University in Minnesota. He holds an MDiv and a THM degree from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and a PhD from Emory University. His research centers on New Testament and early Christianity with a special interest in New Testament textual criticism, especially the text of the Apocalypse, that is the book of Revelation and its reception history. His dissertation on scribal habits and theological influences in the Apocalypse was published by a major German publisher and won international rewards. He's one of the leading scholars on the text, the Greek text of the book of Revelation. He's also a friend of mine, a friend of Dr. Strange, and now a friend of our department and we're really grateful to have him here. Would you please welcome Dr. Hernandez? Well, good morning, everyone. As uh, Dr. Champa said, Juan Hernandez. Um, I guess I should start out by saying that uh, it's, it's a little weird to hear, you know, somebody who studies Revelation and knows a lot about it because when I started on this journey, uh, nobody thought it was a good idea. And uh, what I'm about to show you is essentially uh, a series of things that I found in one manuscript of the book of Revelation. Uh, back when I was at Emory University with uh, Dr. Strange, of course, we have to propose a dissertation idea. And my thought or idea was I'd love to study the manuscripts of Revelation just to see if there's any anything interesting in them, right? It's an esoteric, difficult book. The grammar is a little weird. Certainly the, the visions are bizarre. Uh, Jesus does things that he doesn't do in the Gospels in that book. So there's a lot of things that kind of rub us the wrong way. And so I had proposed uh, to take a look at three manuscripts of the book of Revelation. And I'm going to talk about one of them. Uh, this manuscript here is a fourth century manuscript. So this is written or copied in the 300s. And uh, it was a significant period in the life of the church. There were all kinds of theological debates about the nature of the Son, is Jesus God or not, the nature of the Trinity, all these things. So I kind of had my mind or my radar on my spidey senses, you know. I wonder if there's anything in the text that will illuminate um, the kind of world this manuscript was copied in. And so uh, after proposing the idea, I, by the way, I had no evidence, no evidence whatsoever. Right? This is, this, all this that's, that, that I'm going to show you uh, is kind of like the first time it's been aired in this kind of, I'm not first time here, it was already published, but in publication it was the first time we kind of looked at this in terms of what's going on in a text uh, apart from simply restoring the original. Wrote the dissertation and ended up finding all sorts of fascinating readings that actually alter the text in interesting ways interesting and significant ways that actually are aligned, if you could believe this, with kind of Christian values, Christian ideas, and certainly with the theological climate of its day. So when we say Codex Sinaiticus, all we're saying is the book from Sinai, 
Codex is just an ancient word for book. And so the earliest manuscripts were copied in a book form. They didn't use the scroll as much anymore. It's a book form. So I will be saying Codex Sinaiticus over and over again. You just got to think it's a book. It's a book from Sinai. And the text we're going to look at is a fourth century text of the book of Revelation. All of your Bibles have the book of Revelation in them. You can actually follow on in your Bible if you have a Bible. I'm going to contrast the readings in the book from Sinai, fourth century, with your Bibles. It doesn't matter which one it is, NRSV, NIV, etc., right? And what you will see is a text that is very different. One more thing I'll add, and this is kind of inevi inevitable, because back then it's not like today where you just type stuff up and you have a PDF and everything looks the same. These copies were made by hand, right? The Bible was copied by hand for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. So we will find spelling errors. We will find words that are dropped out. We will find words that are added, right? And so you have this fascinating mix of blunders, scribal blunders, or we call them howlers. Oh, I can't believe you did that. Like a teacher would have a field day with the manuscript, right? And then you have these readings that are sensational and different, right? And so uh, you don't have to know Greek to follow this. I put everything out there in English just to you just kind of follow the idea. And uh, we'll begin with essentially what is not that significant or, you know, shiny in the book of Revelation to kind of get it out of the way and then look at what's spectacular. Okay, so Codex Sinaiticus, the earliest Christian commentary on John's Apocalypse. And by the way, the reason why I call it an early Christian commentary is because there were so many fascinating little changes that it looked like somebody was trying to clarify its meaning. So imagine today, people are always asking questions about the book of Revelation, right? What does this mean? What do you think about the beast? What do you think about the rapture? All these kinds of questions. They didn't ask about the rapture back then, but they had a different set of questions. And some of the changes seem to indicate that they're trying to answer these questions, right? So it's a very fascinating uh, exemplar. Okay, so remember, Codex Sinaiticus, book from Sinai, fourth century manuscript. The Apocalypse in Codex Sinaiticus is a striking example of a fourth century manuscript that differs substantially from the text of our modern Bibles. It exhibits dozens of significant differences in key verses, reflecting the concerns, interests, and idiosyncrasies of its earliest copyist and readers, all of whom were presumably Christian. Taken as a whole, the text of Revelation in Codex Sinaiticus may constitute one of our earliest Christian commentaries on the book, disclosing its fourth century setting and anticipating the later concerns of commentary writers, such as Oikomenius and Andrew of Caesarea from the sixth and seventh centuries, respectively. Codex Sinaiticus is no commentary in the modern sense, however. Its changes range from the spectacular to the mundane and include the theological, the liturgical, the commonplace, and even the infelicitous. It is a text ever in tension with itself, effective both in its capacity to obscure as well as in its regulation of meaning. Clarity and confusion reign together and compete for our attention in this manuscript. Despite that, we can discern a concerted effort throughout its text to elucidate the message of John's apocalypse with scores of changes throughout the manuscript. Some of these are inherited, others are created, all affect the reading of the text. But before we take a look at those spectacular readings in Codex Sinaiticus, it's best to begin with the bad ones, the sobering and infelicitous readings that scramble our attempt at comprehension and make interpretation a challenge. These can be broken up into three categories. They include words that deviate from standard orthography, that is, words that are spelled badly or alternatively, words that are pure nonsense or nonsense in context, and finally, words that are added or omitted carelessly and challenge our best efforts at making sense of the text. Orthographic or spelling differences, although typical of every manuscript, appear to be represented by a very small number of changes to the text of Revelation. These occur in the single digits and include nasal sound variation. That's words with the nye, nye kind of sound. They kind of spelled them hooked on phonics kind of, right? Just the N's and G's. Consonantal variation and the adding or dropping of consonants and vowels. 
The number of these mishaps is remarkably small considering how many opportunities the scribe had to fail. For the most part, this is also true of the vowel diphthong variation. A diphthong, as you may recall from grammar school, is simply a couple of vowels that make one sound in a single syllable. Of the variety of misplaced vowel combinations in a text, most here also number into single digits, with only a couple of exceptions. The first exception is the epsilon to alpha yoda and the alpha yoda to epsilon change, which occurs 16 and 13 times respectively. These are essentially the equivalent of a change from E to AI and AI to E in the English spelling of a word. The second exception is the switch from iota to epsilon iota, which occurs a staggering 131 times. This is equivalent to the change from I to EI in the English spelling of a word. Comparatively speaking, the second exception represents a significant departure from every kind of orthographic variation that has shown up and challenges our ability to speak of standardized spelling. What appears to have been standard is the switch, often haphazard, from iota to epsilon iota, or i to ei. Not even the reverse sequence, the epsilon yoda to yoda change, or ei to i, even comes close, surfacing only 10 times. Now, while it might seem like these are precisely the kind of doldrums that are best avoided, especially with a lay audience, this particular data set does shed light on at least one textual variant in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 4.3, we encounter a scene in which a rainbow, Edis, I-R-I-S, surrounds God's throne. Codex Sinaiticus, however, followed by a few other manuscripts, reads priests, hieres, I-E-R-I-S, surrounding God's throne. That's the significant exception, 4-3. I think I have it. Yeah, so there you have, so you can see it right there. The first line is your Bible, rainbow. The second line is Codex Sinaiticus, priests. And you can look at the Greek, just the letters in I-R-I-S, I, it's very similar, but it's a significant change. So, the change is often explained as a byproduct of mishearing during a time when scribes were copying and pr the pronunciation of the Yoda and the Epsilon Yoda was not differentiated. While that may be true, it is worth noting that while the second syllable of hieres, priests, attests to the widespread vowel switch, the first syllable does not. In fact, the Yoda I to Yoda Epsilon IE change never occurs in a text of Revelation in this manuscript. It is also conspicuous that Edis, rainbow, which occurs only twice in the book of Revelation, is replaced with another word in each occurrence. The fact that the new term here makes perfect sense further suspicions of a deliberate change, thus the patterns of orthographic and textual variation make it unlikely that the insertion of priests here in Revelation 4.3 was a byproduct of mishearing. So, in Codex Sinaiticus, the book from Sinai, priests rather than a rainbow surrounds God's throne. We'll return to this textual variant later. Nonsense readings. Turning to nonsense readings, these are also relatively few in number. They include misspellings that go beyond orthographic variation, grammatically incongruent readings, and readings that make no sense in context or they're contextually nonsensical. The variants in each of these categories also occur in the single digits. As with orthographic variation, the number of nonsense readings is small against the many opportunities for error. The greatest challenge to producing a readable text of Revelation, then, was not wayward spelling. It was not even the senseless repetitions that occur in the text. After all, there are only three instances of ditography, that is, the accidental duplication of words in the entire manuscript. No. The greatest challenge would come from careless omissions. Omissions large enough to reduce every other mishap to the status of peccadillos, or a very minor sin. Most omissions in Codex Sinaiticus consist of one to three words with a few exceptions and have little to no impact on the reading of the text. Articles, conjunctions, and short phrases are routinely dropped out. Once we move to omissions of four to five words at a time, then our capacity to make sense of the text is somewhat hampered. With omissions of six or more words, we find ourselves in hostile territory, facing a text that appears to be disinterested in our comprehension. 
Large omissions appear early in the text. By the time we're halfway through the book, we will have encountered omissions of six, seven, or 11 words alongside smaller ones. In the second half of the book, we find omissions of nine, 12, 17, and 23 words, again, alongside smaller omissions. Most of these appear to be omission from a word in one line to the same word in another. The result is a text with sporadic, haphazard, and piecemeal excisions that defy attempts at a continuous reading. We are left to wonder whether the process of correcting the text was even finished before it left the scriptorium. One thing is clear, however, the text of Revelation in Codex Sinaiticus is definitely shorter than the earliest or the so-called original text. A comparison of every textual difference between Revelation in our Greek New Testament and Codex Sinaiticus reveals that Codex Sinaiticus adds 182 words but omits 389, resulting in a loss of 207 words to the text. Even if we cannot trace every omission to the fourth century scribe, it is clear that the cumulative effect of roughly three centuries of copying has been to produce a shorter text of Revelation. We now turn to those readings that are commonplace. These are sensible changes that surface throughout the manuscript and are the product of harmonization, transposition, which is basically the switching of words, and the substitution of terms and or grammatical changes. Most of these are mundane and easily explicable. A few, particularly among these substitutions, are quite striking and the possible product of early Christian editing. Among the commonplace readings are the so-called nomina sacra, or the sacred names, which pervade this manuscript. These are select nouns or proper nouns that are abbreviated with two or three letters, rather than written out fully. We'll take a look at some of these, as well as of a variety of substitutions. As might be expected, the so-called divine names feature prominently among the nomina sacra. These include Theos, God, Kurios, Lord, Christos, Christ, Jesus, Jesus. With the exception of Christos, Christ, which is written in full once, all of these are rendered as nomina sacra, or abbreviations, without fail. This is true whether they appear alone or in combination, such as with Yesu Christu, Jesus Christ, Kurias Hatheas, God the Lord, or even the striking Hatheas Hokurias, the Lord God. Nomina sacra even surface where the Greek New Testament text has no nouns or pronouns for the abbreviation. All of the nomina sacra appear in contracted form that is abbreviated with two letters, and only once does Jesus, Jesus, appear in conflated form, that is, abbreviated with three letters. Other words that appear as nomina sacra without fail include pneuma, spirit, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Israel, Israel, Dawid, David. Their occurrences as such, however, appears to indicate convention rather than a particularly pious motive. Pneuma, spirit, for example, is turned into an abbreviation or a nomen sacrum, whether it is speaking of the Holy Spirit, the human spirit, or even unclean spirits. Even the adverb pneumaticos, spiritually, which in Revelation 11:8 means allegorically, is turned into a nomen sacrum. The remaining terms, uranos, heaven, anthropos, man, Pater, Father, Omega, and Huia, Son, are turned into nomina sacra the majority of times, but in varying degrees. As a consequence, it is even more difficult to claim that they are theologically significant. For example, although Pater, Father, always refers to God the Father in Greek, it is only changed into a nomen sacrum three out of five times. The title, Huias to Anthropu, the Son of Man, appears as a nomen sacrum only one out of two times. And the only other instance of huias, son, as a nomen sacrum, applies to someone other than Jesus. The most that can be said about the nomen sacra or the sacred names is that their consistent use for the four divine names, God, Lord, Christ, and Jesus, points to a well-established practice. Regrettably, less can be said about the remaining terms, except to note that the transformation of omega into a nomen sacrum from the title, the Alpha and the Omega, is intriguing. 
As noted, some of the most striking changes in Codex Sinaiticus surface among our substituted terms, which are essentially words that are swapped out for others. While many of these changes or exchanges are minor adjustments or even sensible mishaps, a handful appear to betray broader concerns. The first case appears only a few words into the text of Revelation, where the benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all, is narrowed to the grace of the Lord Jesus be with the saints. So here you can see it, servants in your Bible, doulois is changed to saints, hagios in Codex Sinaiticus. Strikingly, or the first case appears, oh yeah, strikingly, this change is replicated at the very end of the book where the benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all, is narrowed to the grace of the Lord Jesus be with the saints. The insertion of saints at these strategic locations strikes a nice balance and leaves no doubt about the book's intended readership. In fact, the saints serve as bookends to the text of Revelation in Codex Sinaiticus. Again, very significant. Holy Ones replaces servants at the beginning and at the end. That's telling you something about its readership. Elsewhere, substituted terms appear to be the byproduct of harmonizing, that is, drawing one text closer to another. The change in Revelation 6.14, where Nasos, island, is replaced with Bunas, valley, looks like a harmonization to Luke 3.5 or possibly Isaiah 40. In these two texts, every mountain and every valley will be brought low on the day of the Lord. In Revelation, however, it is every mountain and every island that will be brought low. By replacing Nasos, island, with Bunas, valley, however, the text of Revelation is brought into greater conformity with the prophetic record. That is to say, the text of Revelation is harmonized with the text of Luke and possibly Isaiah. The rationale for other substituted terms is more difficult to discern. For example, it is unclear why the rainbow that surrounds God's throne in Revelation 4.3 should be changed to priests. We took a look at that. A deliberate change is likely given the patterns of orthographic variation in the manuscript. Its significance, however, remains a mystery. Perhaps the change reflects the custom of having priests stand around a throne, the imperial throne, at the time of Constantine in the fourth century. Irrespective, it is noteworthy that the only other occurrence of rainbow in the book of Revelation is also replaced with another word. This time, Edis, rainbow, is not changed to hieres, priests, but to threeks, hair. The switch occurs in Revelation 10.1. Lost my spot. The switch occurs in Revelation 10.1, where the strong angel straddles the earth and the sea. However, in Codex Sinaiticus, the angel has hair on his head instead of a rainbow. It is likely that the replacement of rainbow with hair reflects a harmonization to Revelation 1.13, where the glorified Son of Man also is described as having hair, high trichus. The fact that various characteristics of the strong angel in Revelation 10.1 already echo those of the Son of Man in Revelation 1 increases the likelihood that the change is meant to draw the two even closer. To this, we might add that there was already an exegetical tradition afoot that identified the two figures as one. Both Victorinus of Patau in the third century and Tychonius in the fourth century asserted that the strong angel was, in fact, the Son of Man. Other substitutions appear to be rather straightforward in their function, such as the change in Revelation 20.13, where the fate of the dead before God's throne is about to be determined. Rather than having them judged according to their works, ekrithesan, Codex Sinaiticus reads that they were condemned in accordance with their works, kate krithesan. The change makes perfect sense in light of the fact that the very same group is thrown into the lake of fire in the next verse. Finally, some substituted terms appear to solve an exegetical difficulty. This is probably the case with hilas, X-I-L-O-S, in Revelation 21.17, which replaces teichas, T-E-I-X-O-S, and means wall. The scene here depicts an angel measuring the wall, the teichas of the city. Codex Sinaiticus, however, has him measuring its hilas, which, as spelled, means fodder and produces nonsense in context. However, if hilas, 
X-I-L-O-S, is actually a variant spelling for Xelos, X-E-I-L-O-S, a change from I to E-I that we have already seen widely attested in this manuscript, then the new term actually means edge and starts to make sense and even solves a grammatical, mathematical problem. Revelation's description of a wall of 144 cubits, understood in a flat, literal manner, is far too small to enclose its gigantic cubical city. The city, after all, is reported to be a cube of 12,000 stadia, or 15,000 miles. 15,000 up, that way, and that way. Cube, 15,000 miles. But its wall is 144 cubits, or 75 yards. It's a big difference between 15,000 miles and 75 yards. However, with the angel measuring the city's edge, chelos, rather than its wall, tejas, the problem magically evaporates. Scores of additional substitutions can be found throughout the text of Codex Sinaiticus. Most are unremarkable. Some, like the aforementioned, can be quite interesting. Others make an unmistakable theological contribution to the text. Before turning to these, however, we'll survey the liturgical expansions of the book of Revelation in Codex Sinaiticus. The book of Revelation contains many scenes of worship, most of them celestial. Doxologies abound in the work, and the whole world celebrates the creative and active redemptive acts of God on cue. Copyists and readers appear to have immersed themselves in this act of worship by expanding the work's liturgical material. The changes that occur are part of a continuum that has already been established by the book itself. What is intriguing, however, is the fact that the added and expanded material appear to point to the work's reverential usage. Perhaps here we even have clear textual evidence that the book of Revelation was in fact considered fit for use within worship settings, at least by its earliest copyists and readers. Most of the adjustments are minor and involve the addition of an amen to an already existing doxology, such as we find in Revelation 4, 9, 4, 10, 11, 15, and 15, 7. So you've got an amen in several texts. I've included just one here. We also have an amen added to the final benediction in Revelation 22, 21. And in Revelation 7, 10, the phrase forever and ever amen is added to a doxology that offers praise to both God and the Lamb and may even be of Christological import. Finally, we have the multiplication of holies in Revelation 4.8. Rather than reading, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, Codex Sinaiticus ascribes eight holies to God, one shy of a perfect nine, which would be capable of crediting three holies to each member of the Godhead, a Trinitarian doxology, if I ever heard one. Now, while we stop short of attributing such motives to our scribe, it is interesting nonetheless that the later Trisagion hymn does precisely that. It offers three holies to each member of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Perhaps the hymn's origin can be traced to this kind of doxological expansion in the text. All of these additions continue a trend already present in the book of Revelation. The expanded doxological material underscores the book's reverential usage and counters any notion of a work unfit for use in worship settings. Presumably, it was this kind of pious usage that led to the book's eventual acceptance. The theological, the payoff. Lastly, we turn to those readings that make a significant theological contribution to the text of Revelation. These readings are remarkable insofar as they continue to move or continue the move towards greater precision and clarity, but they do so in an explicitly Christological direction. We caught a glimpse of this tendency already in the recasting of the strong angel as the son of man in Revelation 10.1. The readings to be discussed here, however, are even bolder in their assertions about Christ and may reflect the fourth century's contentious theological climate. The presence of such striking readings alongside some of the more egregious blunders forces us to differentiate between scribal performance and goals, presumably to produce an accurate copy, and what was already in the exemplar prior to copying. 
It is unlikely that the scribe would simply have thought up some of these changes while also trying to copy the text with care. That being said, the presence of variants that fit so well into their fourth century setting suggests that their introduction into the exemplar may have taken place fairly recently, perhaps just prior to transcription. Jesus was not created, Revelation 3.14. The first of these readings is found in Revelation 3.14. Here, the universally attested title for Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God, to sales to Theu. This text, however, is altered in Codex Sinaiticus to the beginning of the church of God, ecclesias to Theu, a move that eliminates the possibility of placing Jesus within the created order. The change is conspicuous against the backdrop of this period, which was defined by its pitched theological battles over the precise nature of the sun. In fact, it is remarkable how dangerously close the original language of Revelation comes to Arius' own musings about the Son of God. Arius, as you'll recall, was considered a heretic for claiming that Jesus was a created being. In the Thalia fragments, which are believed to be one of the few primary sources to contain Arius' own authentic words, we encounter the following claim. The one without beginning, i.e. God, established the sun as the beginning of all creatures. This Arian formulation is nearly indistinguishable from the original text of the book of Revelation. The fact that such language was eradicated from our verse appears to indicate that the wording was a problem. Revelation 3.14 was therefore harmonized in Codex Sinaiticus towards Colossians 1.18, where Jesus is described as being the head of the church, Kephale Tes Ecclesias. Remarkably, a couple of centuries later, Oikumenius, a 6th century Greek commentator on the book of Revelation, would use this very same verse to discuss the Arian controversy of his day. His text of Revelation 3.14 is identical to what is considered the original text today, and he displays no knowledge of the change in Codex Sinaiticus. Nonetheless, like Codex Sinaiticus, Oikumenius sees fit to interpret Revelation 3.14 in light of Colossians 1 in order to reject the idea that the Son was created. The changed reading in Codex Sinaiticus may therefore represent the earliest use of the book of Revelation to thwart an Arian threat. Jesus does not vomit the Laodiceans. The second Christological reading of some import is found in Revelation 3.16, where we encounter one of the boldest textual changes to the portrait of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Here, Jesus' well-known threat to vomit the Laodiceans out of his mouth is recorded. The text of Codex Sinaiticus, however, is overhauled in such a way as to remove any indication that Jesus is capable of such a grotesque bodily function. Instead of vomiting the Laodiceans out of his mouth, melo se emesai ectus stomatos mu, the text of Codex Sinaiticus reads that Jesus was to stop their mouths, pausai ectus stomatos su. Once again, the theological controversies in the fourth century may prove illuminating here with their debates about how to understand passages that speak about the humanity of Jesus. Passages that refer to Jesus eating, sleeping, being angry, or struggling at Gethsemane posed enough of a problem and a threat and were the subject of rigorous debate in the early church. Presumably, a passage where Jesus threatens to vomit early Christians would have been just as problematic and supplies a rationale for the change here. Of course, this would also mean that the metaphorical thrust of the verse was lost on its earliest copyists and readers. However, this would not have been the first time that has happened. Honor and glory from the Almighty. Finally, in Revelation 5.13, a doxology offered to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb is altered in a very significant way. Here, the majority of the Greek tradition reads, to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be the blessing, honor, glory, and power, kai to kratos. Lost my place again. Kaito Kratos. Codex Sinaiticus, however, replaces Kaito Kratos 
with Pantokratoros, so that the doxology now asserts that both God and the Lamb receive the blessing, honor, and glory of the Almighty. So you go from Kratos, and of the power, to Pantokratoros, of the Almighty. The reading thus transforms four individual qualities into three and unites all of them under the banner of the Almighty. In other words, the text of Codex Sinaiticus makes explicit that the qualities attributed to both the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb proceed from the Almighty, presumably without any distinction whatsoever. Again, it is difficult to exaggerate the significance of such a reading in the fourth century. Turning once more to Arius' own readings in the Thalia fragments, we find that he differentiates between degrees of glory ascribed to each member of the Godhead. Without equivocation, Arius states, there exists a trinity in unequal glories, for their essences are not mixed with each other. In their glories, one is more glorious than the other in infinite degree. By contrast, the language of Codex Sinaiticus appears to preclude such distinctions within the Godhead. The fact that formulations like Arius' appear to have been circulating in the fourth century may have led to an attempt to shield the biblical text of Revelation from similar misapprehension. But wait, there's more. <laughs> well, there's certainly, well, these are certainly among the most spectacular Christological changes to the text. They are by, means, by no means the only ones. Several other substitutions surface and call for further study. These include the change in Revelation 2.22, where Jesus summons Jezebel to a bed of judgment, Kalo, rather than throws her, Balo. Similarly, the change in Revelation 3.20 is also intriguing in its apparent defense of Jesus' sovereignty. Here, it is Jesus himself who opens the door of salvation, anoikso, not the individual being summoned, anoikse. We also note that three out of the four verses that contain the verb skenao, to tabernacle or dwell, are altered in the book of Revelation, perhaps in deference to the incarnational language of John 1.14. Apart from these Christological alterations, we discover that every occurrence of the phrase under the earth, hupokatotes geis, is also dropped from Codex Sinaiticus. While this could be a result of the scribe's eye leaping from one line to the other, it is conspicuous in that both omissions occur in the throne room scene of Revelation 5, a context of celestial worship. The removal of those under the earth, hupokatos teis geis, effectively excludes them from participating in this worship scene. Finally, we encounter the sporadic alteration of angelic roles. The reading of Revelation 9.15, Codex Sinaiticus, for example, denies angelic participation in the act of war. What is striking about this particular textual change is how effectively it sidesteps third century objections to the canonicity of the book in Revelation. Interestingly, Andrew of Caesarea's seventh century commentary also registers concerns over this. So you can see the scribe just inserted not. The angels do not kill, the exact opposite of what the text says. Despite all of these fantastic changes, the text of Codex Sinaiticus to Revelation is a far cry from a full-blown commentary. First and foremost, Codex Sinaiticus is a copied text. As such, its primary role is to transmit the text of Revelation faithfully. And yet, we can already discern a tendency to assist in the book's interpretation with the introduction of a variety of changes. These changes could have accumulated over the years from marginal notes or scribal changes in the exemplars. With their introduction into the codex, however, the transcription be begins to behave like a commentary. Some of these changes could have a greater claim to ancestry, like the transformation of the strong angel or the prohibition against angelic violence, especially since these concerns can be traced back to the third century. The more explicit Christological and even anti-Aryan changes would appear to be more contemporaneous with the transcription of the book. That is not to say that our scribes were simply apologists who were thinking up such changes as they copied. Rather, it is likely that these redactions were already present in their exemplars, even if they were only introduced recently. In light of all this, we may say that insofar as Codex Sinaiticus passes on prior and contemporaneous interpretations of the book of Revelation, it does behave like an early Christian commentary. 
to the degree to which its primary concern is to transmit the text, it does not. What remains to be explored more fully, however, is just how this altered fourth century text of Revelation relates to the changing theological climate of its day and how that might disclose the manner in which a disputed and controversial book like this one gained traction and ultimately acceptance into the canon of the New Testament. Thank you. We have a few minutes for a Q&A. Um, do you have any questions you'd like to ask Dr. Hernandez? Dr. Bradley. Sure, sure. I'll summarize the question, yeah. So uh, tell us a little more about the scribes, the communities that came from the process, that kind of thing. Yeah, so um, first of all, there's a lot we don't know. We don't know. And so uh, I'll tell you what I do know, right? What we do know is that uh, two scribes were responsible for this part of, of the text, the New Testament, Revelation. One scribe wrote the first 34 and a half lines. Another scribe copied the rest, right? One scribe was uh, a better copyist than the other. And so, so that's the first thing, it's, it's two people. Also, uh, they clearly would mark up a, an exemplar, a copy before their copy. So they have a copy they're gonna copy, so they mark it up, and that gets put onto the, their, their page, right? Um, it is likely that a lot of these changes that we see really existed before, because a, a copyist is not conscious, really, right? They're just kind of copying. And as you can see, all of the kinds of mistakes they're making it, you know, they're just having blunders, having blunders, having blunders. But the fantastic readings that show through probably mean they were right there. Now, when they were introduced is a complicated question because they can go back many years or, or fairly recently. So that's why we use kind of what's going on at that time that may connect. So there's that. Uh, the other thing is that this manuscript does not appear to have been corrected extensively in the fourth century. Um, it almost looks like it was incomplete. I and mean, they wrote it all out, but they hadn't corrected everything, so that's why you have all these blunders. In the seventh century, you had a team of scribes come in, correct the text, and so a lot of these fantastic readings, they're gone. Like, they're the cancellation dots over them. So, as fantastic as these readings might be and interesting to us, to them, they just represented a deviation, a bad text, here's a better text. So that's kind of, there's more that could be said, but that, just in a nutshell. Any other questions, like maybe from Mizzy Miller? Yeah, she raised her hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> Clearly, a awful idea. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, and so, um, the bottom line is the larger context. You know, they, they always tell you study context, it'll help you stuff. The larger context of this project was that there were a couple of publications already out there that focused on scribes changing passages in the New Testament. Really famous one was by this scholar named Eldon Epp. He did the book of Acts. He, con he compared two manuscripts, and one of them had so many interesting changes. He, this is back like in 1969 or something, but it was famous, and it's called Theological Tendencies in the Book of Acts, right? Uh, 30 years later, Bart Ehrman uh, studied the manuscripts as well, but he focused on the Gospels, in particular Luke, and he looked at a handful of changes that appear to reflect what he called orthodox changes or corruptions, right? So... Um, Somebody had already done the book of Acts. Somebody had done uh, Gospels. I was at Emory. I had, no, I had no text critical experience. I had no manuscript experience. I was only desperate for a project, and my original idea crashed and burned, right? So I was literally, you know how to say, necessity is the mother of invention? Like, I was, I was literally fighting for my life. How am I going to stay in this program, 
right? And so I knew that Revelation was interesting. I liked the tale, especially loved Greek. And I thought, well, why hasn't anybody done it on the book of Revelation, right? And so uh, Revelation is a natural kind of place because it, it's weird. If there was going to be any changes, this should be the one. And so um, that's what led to Revelation. What led to this manuscript is that it is the first full-length copy of the book to exist. Prior manuscripts of Revelation are all fragmentary, right? So we have the, the most extensive one is like nine chapters, nine through 17 from the third century, but I wanted the whole thing. And so, so that's how that kind of came together. And, and again, when, when I proposed it, I was told by Gail O'Day, she says, uh, you, you, you don't have really any evidence. You just have a, uh, a data-driven hypothesis. So you know how you have, supposed to have a thesis? I didn't even have a thesis. I had a hypothesis, which was, hey, nobody's looked here, right? And if any place should have it, it should be this. And wouldn't you know it, there it is, right? And, and let me just add one last thing. Everything you've seen here has been in the manuscript since the fourth century. It's not like I found them. People were aware of them, but the kinds of questions scholars were asking and the methods they had restricted them to only search for original readings. Everything else was considered garbage. So I literally went rummaging through trash heaps to come up with this. Other questions? Brad. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, uh, let me see if I can remember what the first question was. <laughs> um, oh, how does it compare to other? Okay, so it wants to know how does the changes here compare to other manuscripts? Well, the part of the project that's not here is I also compared it to two fifth century manuscripts Sinaiticus, fourth century, Alexandrinus, fifth, Ephraimi, fifth. So I had three full texts of Revelation across two centuries. And interestingly, all three harmonized, but Revelation and Codex Sinaiticus harmonized a lot more, right? All three omitted more text than they added, but Sinaiticus a lot more. And as far as theological changes, the other two can't even come close. Uh, as a matter of fact, Codex Alexandrinus is considered the best manuscript we have on Revelation. So whereas Sinaiticus for the rest of the New Testament is kind of like the exemplar for our Bibles, in Revelation, it's been Alexandrinus, which is later. So, so, so yeah, so this is, a, this is a, a, an anomaly, an anomaly. And here's the other thing I would, I would add. Uh, it is very well possible that what appears to be anomalies will evaporate if we discover more manuscripts that had some of these readings. It's just that they are all congregated here in this one, you know, manuscript. So it's just really fascinating in that sense. So, so it is, it is uh, until further notice, you know, it is it's kind of illusory, right? But it's intriguing and possible. Um, as far as determining what's original, and that, that's a whole different uh, uh, series of, of approaches. But here's the big one. You essentially look at um, all the manuscript tradition, and you've got a series of judgments you make based on the date of the manuscripts, right? You've got the external evidence, geographical distribution, that kind of thing. And then internal evidence, you know, what the scribe was most likely to do, et cetera. Um, all of these readings that you have here, a lot of them are singular. They are only in this manuscript. And um, the other manuscripts essentially either ignore them or correct them, right? And so what one, one criterion is that the more difficult reading is probably the earlier one because scribes would try to correct it, soften it up. And so so many of these are clear attempts to, to clean it up. I mean, who's going to change the beginning of the church of God to the beginning of creation of God, right? I mean, that, that just, you know, doesn't quite go that way in, in, in our circles. Uh, so there's that. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Feel free to come up and ask more questions if you'd like. Uh, would you thank Dr. Hernandez again? And thank you for coming.